Okay, well, welcome back, everyone. We will now kick off the next session, uh, which is the global bioeconomy. We have some incredible speakers joining us with this session. James, do you want to pop yours on mute? I will hand over to Tiana Nan, who is the Group Manager of Policy from LMS Energy. As I said, they're sponsors of today's event. Uh, we're delighted to have their support and, and they really are strong contributors as are EDL and, and other organisations supporting today's event across the work that we're doing at Bioenergy Australia. So I will hand over now. Thank you, Shahana, for that welcome. And uh, thank you both to the Bioenergy Australia Committee for organising this wonderful day and for the thoughtful insights from the Minister and the Shadow Minister. I'm delighted to introduce uh, this session. Uh, we are proud to support this important event looking into the future of bioenergy. So LMS Energy is Australia's leading bioenergy from waste company, seeking to organically power a circular economy. Through this session, I'm going to talk about LMS Energy and introduce some of the global imperative very briefly, and then introduce the eminent speakers that we have from North America, Singapore, and New Zealand for this session. LMS has 40 years of unrivaled industry experience. It is a third generation company that's found, been founded with innovative ideas that continue through to today. Emmanuel Fauzon was the first to work out how to capture landfill biogas to actually help reduce fuel costs at his brick kilns. And then realized that there was a deep opportunity here and moved into growing that business. The innovation has continued across time as per the list here. And now we have moved to having solar projects on landfills. And most recently, the first Australian manufactured modular dry anaerobic digestion plant, which has received planning approval for use on a South Australian landfill and which is currently being constructed in our prospect office. So what is landfill biogas capture as a starting point? There are many forms of, of bioenergy. Very briefly, what we do is offer a full service that we design and install the gas systems at landfills where we capture the gas and then we either flare that gas or use it to power uh, the generation of electricity. And obviously this can also move to biomethane and biofuels. We manage all of the distribution, we sell the carbon and electricity products for our clients, offering a one-stop shop. Our history has been based in landfill, but we are a bioenergy recovery specialist focused on organic waste. These organic waste may come from landfill or they may have been collected for separate recovery through anaerobic digestion. Through this innovative approach to maximising gas capture from the breakdown of organic waste, we have grown to have 59 sites across Australia, as well as a range of sites across New Zealand and it, uh, as of last year, the US as well. In Australia, we have grown to have an 81 megawatt capacity, generating around 600 gigawatt hours per year. We have estimated 180 petajoules of bioenergy reserves to 2040. And coming back to that innovation theme, we have in-house Australian manufacturing. We do our design, our construction, manufacturing here in Australia, meaning that we have that opportunity to keep innovating as our circumstances change. And this successful approach has seen LMS grow to have 190 dedicated employees. It's also seen Sims Energy, one of the world's great recyclers, and recently voted the 11th most sustainable corporation in the world that uh, amongst the top 100 most sustainable corporations to invest a 50% stake in LMS Energy back from 2001. So what does our work across the country achieve? 
At the moment, the waste sector is responsible for about one third of all the Australian carbon abatement that is occurring. It is a major contributor. From that, landfill biogas capture is responsible for over 90% of these emission reductions. And LMS is responsible for over half of those reductions from landfill. What this means is we are making a real difference to the carbon emissions coming from Australia. We save over 45 million tonnes of carbon from being emitted into the atmosphere, and that's grown to around 4.5 million tonnes being saved every year. We want to keep contributing to a sustainable future for us all. And it's our vision to be the world's leading bioenergy company, organically powering the circular economy. We have the focus on landfill biogas and also biogas from anaerobic digestion to make sure that we are capturing the heat, energy and nutrient values of our organic waste to help power a circular economy where we keep materials circulating at their highest utility and avoid pollution and waste. We're very proud to have recently entered a strategic partnership with Helmont Energy and Mark Jonker is speaking later today uh, to help ensure that we're reaching into not just our household waste but also agricultural waste and commercial waste also. So what does LMS offer the energy and waste sectors? The material that we provide, the electricity we provide is renewable and reliable. It's dispatchable and flexible. It can help support our transition to a wholly renewable system, aiding system security, providing frequency and inertia. It also, biogas has the potential to be upgraded into other forms of energy, biomethane, as uh, we will hear and encourage across today, biofuels also, and of course, biogas can be upgraded and converted to green hydrogen in a ready manner. It doesn't just help with electricity, it helps ensure that we are achieving the best organic waste management possible and supporting our soil health and the carbon reduction opportunities offered through compost and renewable fertilizers coming from anaerobic digestion also. Now we're very proud to be contributing our part and the bioenergy sector supports the development of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, particularly around affordable and clean energy, of course, but creating decent work, economic growth, a clear contributor supporting climate action and supporting more responsible consumption and reduction through managing waste better. This ability to drive multiple benefits means that we also work across multiple policy areas, energy, waste and carbon. Bioenergy offers the opportunity for renewable low carbon future and it can also help with our waste needs. Our global speakers will further discuss the energy and carbon opportunities and work in these areas. I'd like to just very briefly highlight how it can help with our waste issue as well. So one of the things to be aware of is the world generates 2.01 billion tonnes of municipal solid waste, so household waste annually. And this is expected to grow to 3.4 billion tonnes, more than double the population growth across the same period by 2050. Around half of uh, municipal solid waste is typically comprised of food and organic garden organics, and this is rather higher in developing nations. We have a massive opportunity to make better use of the embodied energy, heat and nutrients captured within this material and move from a linear process to a circular process. I would now like to introduce our eminent speakers for the, the upcoming Global Bioeconomy session. Very much looking forward to them. I'll give a rundown of each of them briefly. I also encourage their fuller biographies uh, on the uh, information for this session, of course, and then we'll turn to Paul.
So Paul Bennett is the chair of the International Energy Agency Bioenergy Executive Committee. He's been an active member of that committee since 2014 and was elected chair in 2021 for a two year period. He helps to raise awareness on the latest international developments on new conversion technologies, bioenergy deployment, policy development and key sustainability issues. He's also a board member of Bioenergy Association New Zealand and the National Energy Research Institute of New Zealand. Working in many roles at BP over many years, in 2005 he was part of a small team that established the BP Biofuels Business Unit and has been working on bioenergy and biofuels ever since. In 2009, he left BP and worked in various bioenergy roles from business development through government strategy. Since 2014, he has been the science leader of the Clean Technology Group at Skyon. Key activities there have included the development of New Zealand's Biofuels Roadmap and the Royal Society's Climate Change Mitigation Options for New Zealand report. He'll be followed by Chris Tyndall, who's the Assistant Director for Commercial Aviation Alternative Fuels Initiative. Chris is the Assistant Director of that initiative, whose goal is to promote the development and commercialisation of sustainable aviation fuel options, while also offering environmental improvement and security of energy supply. Chris Tyndall was appointed Queensland Strategic Biofutures Advisor in 2018. He provides a direct connection between the Queensland government and key industry stakeholders, both globally and domestically, with a focus on North America. He's also an adjunct professor on the faculty of the Queensland University of Technology, where he assists in exploring biofuel and biorefinery opportunities. Chris had a long Navy career uh, ahead of this, including successfully leading the Great Green Fleet effort in which the US Navy acquired and used 77 million gallons of F-76 alternative fuel blend for their ships for deployment in 2016. He has had the honour to be named in the peer selected competition for the top 100 people in the Bioeconomy Awards by the Biofuels Digest from 2013 through 2017. We'll then hear from Steve Bartholomews, Head of Public Affairs at APAC Neste. Steve is the Head of Public Affairs and leads all public policy and advocacy efforts in the company's engagement with governments, public sector organisations, think tanks and other key stakeholders. He leads all public affairs efforts for Neste's renewable road transport, renewable aviation, renewable polymers and chemical business in APAC and supports the feedstock growth and supply teams. Stephen is an experienced public affairs professional with over 20 years international, regional and local experience managing issues, engaging stakeholders and delivering communications and public affairs strategy. Finally, we'll have Johanna Siskerdo, uh, who is the founder and chief executive officer of the Coalition for Renewable Natural Gas. Uh, the coalition represents and provides public policy advocacy and education to the renewable natural gas industry. Through effective advocacy and education, the coalition has successfully protected and expanded existing markets and created new RNG market demand at the federal, state, provincial and local government levels in the United States and Canada. Its membership is international and includes leading companies and organisations across the entire industry group, including producers of more than 95% of RNG in North America. Johannes is a passionate advocate and entrepreneur with more than 20 years of organisational leadership and business development experience. And prior to founding the coalition, he served as a legislative director in California State Assembly, serving ranking legislative members on a range of committees. I'm very pleased to introduce this eminent lineup, and I will now stop sharing my screen and hand over to Paul. Well, um, good morning, everyone. Hopefully you can um, see my, my screen now and hear me. Um, thanks to Tiana, there's no need for me to introduce myself. Um, I think she did a very good job of, of uh, 
of telling you what I'm all about. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Shahana and Bioenergy Australia for the kind invitation to speak at this uh, uh, virtual conference. And also, before I start, a, a huge word, word of thanks to Bioenergy Australia for their immense contribution to the work of IEA Bioenergy. They are really one of our major players in the bioenergy family. I want to take the next 10 minutes just to give you a bit of an overview of how bioenergy can contribute to achieving net zero emissions uh, by 2050 in the energy sector at a global scale. And then I'll cover a little bit about the role of IA bioenergy and what we are trying to achieve and what we're doing. So the next few slides will be taken out of the IEA report, net zero by 2050 roadmap. This, this was published last year, and it was um, a piece of work that looked to assess the best options for meeting net zero emissions in the energy sector. The report paints a very good picture of what this future transi transition could look like um, towards stable and affordable energy supplies for all um, this, is, this analysis was uh, global in its outlook and recognizing that the circumstances will be very different in every country around the globe. There, but however, there are still some common themes um, and some specific points that will be pertinent to Australia or to New Zealand or Europe or the US or, or, or any other country for that matter. This is the crux of their, their, their analysis. This shows the evolution of total energy supply um, from 2000 through 2020 out to 2050 um, across the world. It shows um, from 2020 to 2050 a decline in total energy uh, demand around the world. And so then that, that is in despite of a, a, you know, a, a two billion um, person population growth and it's despite of having to provide access to clean energy for maybe about two and a half billion people who, who currently don't have access to any clean energy. So yeah, a, a reduction in total energy demand, large, largely driven by um, energy efficiency gains. But what we do see is a, a large decline in fossil fuels um, and that is taken up by renewable energy options um, um, largely. Specifically to bioenergy, however, we see a decline in the traditional uses of bioenergy, the, the um, ho home heating and home cooking, um, and uh, a growth in modern uses of biomass for bioenergy purposes. And by 2050, um, we see sort of bioenergy contributing um, around 18% of the total energy demand around the globe. The analysis also looked at um, where we're going to get this biomass from. What is biomass availability looking like? And, and, and the IEA took uh, a really close um, notice of, of sustainability. They had very strict sustainability criteria in doing this analysis, and they also um, considered the competition for biomass between food, um, fiber, and fuel. And, and in my view, they came up with a fairly conservative view of what is available around the globe. And they show 60% um, of biomass needed to deliver that 18% of total energy um, could be um, um, achieved through the use of residues and wastes, particularly um, agricultural and forestry and industry wastes. And the, the remaining 40% um, could be achieved through um, cult cultivation of bioenergy crops, whether it's conventional bioenergy uh, crops like oil seeds and sugar cane, but, but those are probably going to go into decline, um, through to new crops such as short rotation lignocellulosic crops, whether that's short rotation forestry or, or whatever. So, um, Sustainability, a big, um, a big criteria taken into account, but nevertheless, a, a, a good view that uh, bioenergy at the scale that they, the IEA sees being necessary is achievable. Some of the main conclusions from the report um, 
was that sustainable bioenergy is an essential part of uh, achieving a low carbon scenario in the in the energy sector and, uh, and bioenergy contributes 18% of that total energy supply by 2050. Um, biofuels can play a very important role in a range of different sectors, so the transport sector, but also in the power and industrial heat sectors. And um, one, one feature that I haven't mentioned so far is the potential combination of bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, or CCS, can provide um, negative emissions. That's basically extra extracting carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And this was a, um, this was a technology that IEA think is, is pretty important to uh, deploy. But quite importantly, they also acknowledge that progress in bioenergy is much, much slower than is, ac is actually needed. And we need to really um, accelerate the deployment of existing technologies. We need to accelerate commercialization of new technologies. We need to make sure that um, su sustainable um, supply chains are developed and appropriate sort of poli policy frameworks are in place uh, for, for the sustainable use of bioenergy. And um, we need to build the technical and regulatory capacity around the world, not just in some specific countries. Um, and there are some specific countries that are ahead of the game, but we need to do that right the way around the globe. So that's where bi IEA Bioenergy comes in. Um, we can play a role in facilitating some of those um, um, accelerations that are required. So IEA Bioenergy is a Technology Collaboration Partnership, or TCP. We're not legally bound to IEA, um, but um, we are um, functioning under a framework that was created by IEA, along with a range of other renewable energy TCPs. So IEA has um, TCPs on hydrogen, on, it, on automotive fuels, on electric vehicles, on solar. Um, so we're just part of that bigger family of IEA TCPs. Our goal is to support the international collaboration and information exchange on all things related to bioenergy and hopefully resulting in more rapid commercialization and deployment of, of bioenergy technologies. There are 26 um, contracting parties as part of IEA Bioenergy. Um, and these include countries with a long history of bioenergy um, use, such as US and Brazil, through to countries that are looking to grow its, their bioenergy uh, use. We are structured into a series of, of topic areas or tasks, and, the, and um, we have special projects that focus on uh, pertinent issues of the time. This, as I said, we're structured around uh, specific topic areas or tasks. Um, these topic areas, tasks uh, are arranged right the way along, along the supply chain, um, going from resources and biomass supply through to conversion technologies such as liquefaction or gasification or anaerobic digestion, um, through to um, the de development, <coughs> excuse me, of energy and product markets and what policies are required to accelerate um, those markets. <clears throat> and then um, there's a lot of work looking at si system perspectives such as climate change and sustainability or, or where does bioenergy sit in the total, to total energy system. We also run, as I said, sort of special uh, uh, projects or strategic pod projects and they're decided upon by the executive committee and task leaders and are based upon what are the you know really burning issues forgive the pun burning issues of the time um, and as a, a technology a collaboration partnership we're able to draw upon hundreds of the world's leading experts to um, um, to, 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 to uh, conduct that work so we think um, bioenergy has a unique role. It is available now and it's ready for deployment. It's vers versatile um, and it can be deployed into a range of different sectors, heat, power, transport, fuels. It is storable and so it complements the intermittent renewables such as solar and, 
and um, wind in, in the power system. And as I said previously, it can remove CO2 from the atmosphere when it's coupled with um, carbon capture and storage. Um, but key, key to it is it must be produced and used sustainably. Um, if it's not used sustainably, we're totally going to undermine uh, bioenergy and we will not see its deployment being accepted by the public. So every few years, every five years, IA Bioenergy conducts um, a re review of, um, of renewable um, energy and, and particularly bioenergy um, use across our member countries. Um, not only does it look at the total amounts of bioenergy use, it, but, but, but we also report upon the policies that have been implemented to, to encourage bioenergy. And um, said there's a, a report for every country that is um, part of the IEA Bioenergy TCP, but there's also um, a synthesis report covering all, all countries and comparing different activities. And as I said previously, direct comparison between countries is difficult due to a, a range of different resource availabilities. Um, but generally we've seen you know, a, a good growth in bioenergy um, from 20, uh, 2005 through to uh, now. But the, but the purpose of this sort of comparison is not really to name and shame countries, but to really to, to uh, help those countries that do um, want to um, deploy or more rapidly deploy bioenergy, help them to identify where countries have um, accelerated bioenergy bioenergy deployment and look at what policies they have implemented. So it really is a learning opportunity. And finally, what, what do we see? Uh, what does IEA bio, uh, Bioenergy see as the role of uh, role for bioenergy? And I think it's entirely consistent with where AEA, uh, IEA were coming from when they looked at the entire um, renewable energy options. Um, you know, we we think it's really important um, in pathways uh, to achieve global, to ensure that we get to um, pathways that t keep global warming below 1.5 or 2 degrees. There's no silver bullets here. Um, there are a, a mix of op options. Um, we're going to see bioenergy uh, deployed alongside solar, alongside uh, hydro, alongside wind. Um, and, and I think you know, we should be really targeting to those difficult to abate sectors. And and I think um, um, Minister, Minister Taylor mentioned earlier, sort of SAF being one of those areas where bioenergy or bio, liquid biofuels is going to be critical. Marine um, biofuels are probably going to be important. The use of biomass for uh, high temperature heat provision is going to be important. I mentioned uh, the potential role of uh, BEX uh, or coupling bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. But it's clear there, is, there, there will be limits to biomass. There's going to be limits to land availability because of this food versus fuel versus fiber competition. But bioenergy can be achieved sustainably. We know how to do that. And the TCP has um, tasks looking at that area. So, so with that, I think I'll uh, finish. And then I think um, I then hand over to Chris. So Chris Tyndall from um, the Assistant Director of CAFE. Great, thank you very much, uh, Paul. And uh, I will now share my screen. All right. So uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, I, I really do appreciate and. Uh, the, the opportunity um, to be a part of this uh, very illustrious panel. Uh, thank you to uh, Bioenergy Australia, to, to Shahana, Lauren, and the rest of the, the, the great team there. I really do appreciate everything that, uh, that y'all are doing. Um, and as, um, as was, was mentioned before, a uh, very nice introduction uh, across the board. Um, so you know who I am. Um, and so I wanna basically go into how within the global bioeconomy, how sustainable aviation fuel really fits into that, that picture, uh, because a part of my job is 
being the assistant director there at, at CAFI. Uh, so I want to first start out uh, with this picture here uh, is taken over at uh, Los Angeles Airport. This was uh, March of 2016 when we first started the, the continuous operation and consumption of, uh, of sustainable aviation fuel by United Airlines on a continuous basis. So if anybody has flown through uh, LAX uh, at any point since March of 2016, you have been flying on some parts of uh, sustainable aviation fuel. The reason I say that is because at most airports, uh, they only have um, basically fuel tanks for everybody. So there's not a United fuel tank, uh, storage tank, um, so everybody gets little molecules of the sustainable aviation fuel. United is the only one that can actually claim it because they were the ones who, who actually purchased it, uh, but everybody's actually using it. So I wanna uh, sort of set the stage and look at um, our overall commitments. Um, there's been a couple of different uh, areas where we have had some efficiencies that have helped to lower our greenhouse gas emissions within the aviation industry. Uh, just overall efficiencies that have happened uh, certainly helped uh, quite a bit. Um, but then uh, our second goal is to be carbon net growth um, from 2020 onwards. Um, and that's part of the, uh, the Corsia, the carbon offsetting and a reduction scheme for international aviation, part of their goals. And then of course, uh, by 2050, we wanna have, um, uh, basically, uh, half of our um, half of our uh, overall greenhouse gas emissions uh, actually be from the baseline of, of 2005. So we want to get to net zero net zero growth uh, overall and uh, and not be a carbon emitter whatsoever. So that's where we're that's where we're headed. Right now, though, we do know that there are, uh, we do have some progress that's been actually happening. Uh, we have significant commercial pull on the demand side. We do have some facilities that are online uh, globally, not just in the United States, but uh, we also have um, some plants, uh, Finland and France, um, and hopefully we'll have something, uh, something happening in Australia uh, sometime, you know, this uh, within this decade, I know there's certainly been a lot of effort on that that uh, that perspective, and the bioenergy roadmap will certainly help us to to get there too. Uh, we do have a line of sight to the first billion gallons, uh, but we realize that that billion gallons is really only one percent of the total market need uh, across the board. Um, Globally, we consume about 97 billion gallons a year. That's about 367,000 megaliters. Um, and in, and in right now, our, our consumption of sustainable aviation fuel is right at about maybe 1%. I'm sorry, less point uh, 0.1%. Um, so we still have a long ways to go. Um, hopefully by 2030, we'll get to 1%. Um, that's that. Um, it's that's going to be approximately uh, one one billion gallons. Um, and this is a a chart that we have uh, we've put together um, at CAFI. And so we hope by 2025 we'll have about uh, 5,300 megaliters of uh, of actual capacity. Um, and that's uh, again globally from all these different entities across the board. You can see where all of those uh, all of those play into it. Um, and that's, that's a beautiful thing is we do have some things coming online. However, we also know that the demand uh, is, is extremely high. Uh, we do know that we need to decarbonize the aviation industry and hopefully we'll be able to get there um, with all of this, uh, this extra, extra production that we have coming online over the next five years in the next 10 years, and then all the way out to 2050 as well, too. We do have a, a number of, of uh, commitments of greater ambition uh, across the board. Uh, here in America, Airlines for America, they have uh, said that by 2050, we definitely want to have redu reduced our carbon emissions um, by 50% <clears throat> at a minimum. Um, FedEx, and then we even have a lot of different uh, governments 
around the world. Norway and the, the Netherlands have actually committed to um, a much lower um, carbon emissions by by having some mandates in place uh, for uh, the military for the Netherlands, and then just overall, they want to have a uh, make sure that we are doing something from 2020 onwards. And uh, we've we've actually Norway's been able to to achieve that. And again, we have a long ways to go until we get to the um, to 2030 and then to 2050. Um, and then there there's some situations where um, these uh, these commitments of of greater ambition have even led to where the customers are willing to pay a little bit of extra um, in order for them to to sort of pay it forward. Uh, so they're paying an incremental price of the sustainable aviation fuel uh, across the board. And that's uh, that's very encouraging knowing that the flying public is aware of that and they're willing to pay a little bit extra for that as well too. That certainly helps until we get to the point where we have um, uh, the sustainable aviation fuel coming in at parity uh, with uh, fossil-based jet fuel. So what's actually happening out in Australia? Well, we do know that uh, that there are some some movements afoot. Uh, Qantas, as we, was mentioned earlier, uh, has been been able to do a flight from uh, LAX to Melbourne um, on the on this, and and that was based in January of 2018. Ajivo also did some um, some uh, demonstration flights out of Brisbane Airport. Um, they were using uh, the fuel that was um, that was brought over from the from the United States. Um, and now we we do know that there are some uh, some companies are actually exploring uh, different areas of Australia and looking for a uh, first site for a to uh, to actually establish a biorefinery operation um, using different types of of uh, feedstocks. And I'll get into the, the feedstocks here in a minute, but the important thing to to realize is there are some 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 good activities that are actually happening within Australia uh, that will hopefully help um, help us get to uh, to our goals that's uh, that's being uh, wants to be reached by the by the overall roadmap bioenergy roadmap. So we do know that uh, that there are certainly a lot of actions that I've, I showed to you, but we want uh, Australia to uh, to follow in the wake of all these other companies that are out there, and, and then ba basically be a trailblazer in the Western Pacific region. That would be that'd be wonderful. The, uh, one of the amazing things that's that's great about Australia is that there are a lot of types of inexpensive feedstocks. That can be used for advanced biofuels uh, to feed a lot of different uh, biorefineries across the board. So that would be a very nice thing to have happen. Uh, at the same time, we don't have to have that um, that sustainable aviation fuel or even renewable diesel, for that matter, being shipped out of uh, at a country. We could use it right there in Australia because um, there are a lot of different companies that have already said that they that they want it. And we have uh, talked to a, a number of them, uh, you know, all the way down the line. And so there are uh, there are these that are, you know, the, the major airlines, Australia Post, the U.S. Navy certainly has uh, has has inquired about that in the past too. And then uh, there are all the many many ports that we have that have a large maritime demand for renewable diesel. But uh, bottom line though is that the roadmap will help to stimulate multiple initiatives and attract some good technology providers to help fill that gap uh, between the feedstocks and the overall end users. So I really do appreciate uh, being a part of this uh, panel again, and I'm looking forward to, to, uh, to seeing your questions and, and answering your questions. Um, we really do appreciate um, everything that you're doing uh, down under, and I hope to get down there uh, again very soon. And at this point, what I will do is I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Stephen Bartholomew, who is the head of public affairs for the Asia Pacific region. And uh, that's for, uh, for Neste. So Stephen, over to you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, and let me now uh, share my screen. And um, that should be coming up soon. 
Um, all right. And I hope that you can all see my screen right now. Yeah. We can. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, good morning. And thank you very much also to the organizers at Bioenergy Australia for giving me this opportunity uh, to participate in the summit. Um, I'm just going to spend, I've got about 10 minutes, so I'm, I'm very quickly going to do a quick introduction to Neste, who we are and what we do, because that helps set, set the tone, and then talk to you about the challenges and the opportunities, and, and the speakers who have gone before me have also spoken about the biofuels opportunity. And, and I want to close with how smart regulation can actually help move this opportunity forward. So. As a little bit of background to Neste, um, Neste's purpose is to create a healthier environment for our children. And it shows in our transition from 1948, when we were set up to secure Finland's oil supply to today, where we have moved on to become the world's number one producer of renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel from waste and residue. And these efforts have been uh, continuously recognized by international organizations like Corporate Knights, where we've uh, been part of the 100 most sustainable corporations for uh, 16 years. But I think more importantly, and, and this is where we all need to collaborate and, and work together, um, you know, a lot of companies talk about reducing uh, their own emissions and they've got emission reduction targets, as does Neste. But I think more importantly, what can we do collectively to help our customers reduce their emissions? And in 2020, Neste helped our customers reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by 10 million tons, which is a significant amount. And just yesterday, we announced that in 2021, we had helped our customers reduce their emissions by 10.9 million tons. And we have an overall target of by 2030, helping our customers to reduce their emissions by uh, 20 million tons. Now, currently our renewable products capacity is, is at about 3.2 million tons per annum, but this is set to grow to 4.5 million tons per annum in 2023. So there is uh, an opportunity with biofuels very clearly for us as an organization. And we primarily focus on, on three areas which is renewable road transport, where our renewable diesel can help reduce emissions by about 90% compared to fossil diesel. Uh, in renewable aviation, where sustainable aviation fuel uh, is, is really taking off, if you like. And then finally, more recently, in renewable polymers and chemicals, uh, where we are working to tackle one of the biggest challenges <clears throat> we face globally, which is around plastics and plastic waste. And, and all the products that we make, and, and Chris uh, alluded to you know, um, waste and residue in his presentation, we use about 10 different waste and residue oil and fats and vegetable oils to make our products. And in 2020, waste and residue accounted for about 90, 92% of all the renewable raw materials um, we, we used. Now, moving on to the challenge, why? biofuels and why a biofuels opportunity. In, in 2019, the global oil consumption was about 4,525 million tons of oil equivalent per annum. And out of this, the global oil demand for the transport industry was around 2,600 million tons of oil equivalent per annum. And in 2020, if you look at um, the electric vehicles, there were around 10 million electric vehicles, and they helped displace about 6 million tons of oil equivalent in 2020. The global renewable fuels consumption helped displace about 98 million tons of oil equivalent. Now, if you look into the future and where the opportunity lies, in 2040, if you look at um, the IEA's World Energy Outlook and also some modeling that Neste has done. You know, if you take into consideration that there'll be around 600 million electric vehicles, that would account for about 360 million tons of oil equivalent oil displacement. 
depending on feedstock availability, and I have a slide that shows you that there will be uh, plenty of feedstock for renewable oil, renewable fuel production. We expect about 1,071 million tons of oil equivalent oil displacement by 2040. So what this means is that electric vehicles and renewable fuels, and don't forget there's other technologies being developed as well, can actually substitute more than 50% of crude oil in transportation. But the reality is that to make this happen, smart regulation is required. And if you look at um, sustainable aviation fuel, for example, we can see that there's strong growth in this sector in the aviation fuel market with opt-in schemes, incentives, and also sustainable aviation fuel mandates. So for example, in Americas, you've got opt-ins um, in Washington, Oregon, and California. There's currently a bill going through Congress, which is the Sustainable Aviation Fuel Blenders Tax Credit Proposal. And we have other states also looking at opportunities uh, in terms of opt-in schemes. <clears throat> in Europe, uh, last year, the Refuel EU initiative was announced, which will see uh, a 2% uh, mandate of sustainable aviation fuel at all EU airports, and then growing to 5% in 2030. And here in Asia as well, we are seeing more interest. For example, in New Zealand, um, there will be a sustainable aviation fuel mandate discussed this year. They've already got a biofuels mandate uh, that will come into play by 2023. So in on the aviation side, we see that opt-in schemes, incentives and mandates are really helping to drive or uh, help this industry take off. And the same would be true of road transportation, where global renewable diesel demand has the potential to exceed 30 million tons by 2030, driven by mandates and incentives. And here again, in North America, you've got um, multiple states looking at low carbon fuel systems. Um, in South America, you've got Brazil leading the way with transport emission reductions. And in Europe, again, we've got the Fit for 55 package, um, which will further increase the general ambition for biofuels. And as I mentioned here in the Asia Pacific region as well, uh, there is some demand driven by voluntary decarbonization emerging in markets like Japan. We certainly have seen as Neste uh, some interest from Australian corporates as well. And in New Zealand, um, which has really taken the lead, if you like, in the Asia Pacific region. Um, the proposed sustainable biofuels mandate uh, of 3.5%, which is a greenhouse gas emissions reduction mandate by 2025, which will then continue to grow up to 2035, uh, shows tremendous potential and opportunity for biofuels. And then finally, what about the feedstock? Because this is a question that, that a lot of um, customers ask us, what's the availability of feedstock? Now, waste and residue availability, we expect it to grow to about 40 million tons uh, per annum by 2030. And you'll see here that, um, you know, if you look at the regional spread, uh, the Asia Pacific region has tremendous growth potential in this space as well. And in addition to all of the existing feedstock, uh, of waste and residue. There's also new feedstock development taking place. Uh, and this could actually help grow it beyond 40 million tons. So we see, for example, novel vegetable oils, uh, lignocellulosic technology, as well as municipal solid waste, and then raw materials, which are enabled by power to x technologies as well. So in closing, um, I would say that <clears throat> ambitious, future targets to address climate change are vital. And we see a lot of countries talking about what they want to do in 2030, 2035, or 2050. But clearly our actions today are also very, very important if we are to tackle this problem. And renewable diesel, sustainable aviation fuel are among the solutions for reducing transport related greenhouse gas emissions. And there is no silver bullet for tackling this issue. So we need to look at all technologies that are available. But we also need to look at what actions we can take today. And 
renewable diesel and SEF present options that are available today and can be used right now. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to uh, hand over to, stop sharing my screen first, and I'm going to hand it over to Johannes Escudero, who's the founder and chief executive officer for the Coalition for Renewable uh, Natural Gas. So Johannes, over to you. Wonderful. Not sure if everyone can hear me okay or not. Let's see if we can yes, share our screen. We can, Johannes. Wonderful. Okay. I will share our screen here. I'm not sure if I've lost controls here or not. Um, we, we can hear you, but not see your screen at the moment. For some reason, I apologize. We are running into tef technical difficulties here where it's not wanting me to share the screen. Um, bear with us here. Johannes, would you like me to share the screen? There's been a couple updates to the slide deck, I think from the version that we emailed um friday last week so i'd like to get the most current bear with me here There we go. I think we're able to circumnavigate uh, the controls there. Can everyone see the presentation now? Yes, we can. You just need to make it uh, larger. We'll do it here. Bear with this here. How's that? A bit anticlimactic, but uh, I will be diligent to move forward expeditiously here so as not to lose time in the program. Again, let me echo Shahana, Lauren, um, thank you for the invitation to present on uh, this online summit today about renewable natural gas in North America, as has been respect, uh, requested. Uh, I will not belabor the point with any extended introductions to myself, aside from the fact that I'm clearly uh, uh, struggling with technical difficulties here today. Um, I have the, the honor of leading the Coalition for Renewable Natural Gas, along with an incredible team, uh, 16 of us working full-time 
to advance our organization's mission, uh, supported by uh, chairs elected by our membership who lead five different leadership advisory boards uh, and provide invaluable expertise, experience, and input that ultimately influence our effective advocacy at the federal, state, and provincial levels in the United States and Canada, as well as public education in terms of educating the general public and improving, increasing awareness about best practices, et cetera. Uh, the Coalition for Renewable Natural Gas, we represent 351 member companies. I say companies rather loosely because that does include uh, municipalities, so cities and counties, as well as colleges, universities, airports, ports. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, the entire value or supply chain across the renewable natural gas space from the waste collection, waste management, recycling companies, all the way through to the end users, including 90 uh, producers of 90% of all the renewable natural gas in North America. And I'll skip past a few of these slides, which provide just a graphic representation of the different membership segments that we uh, represent, along with the Clean Cities Partners, which is funded by the United States Department of Energy um, and are critical to us having surveillance eyes and ears on the ground at the more granular and local levels. Uh, our mission is to advocate and educate for the sustainable development deployment and utilization of renewable natural gas or RNG as we refer to it. So that ultimately not just present but future generations also will have access to domestic renewable clean fuel and energy. Uh, we founded the coalition on July 7th, 2011. So we just celebrated our 10 year anniversary this past summer, but consistent from the beginning, our position has always been that we support renewable natural gas and increasingly derivatives of RNG, including but not limited to renewable hydrogen produced from all sustainable feedstocks. We represent and support all sustainable and competing technologies. And of course we support the development of renewable natural gas and renewable hydrogen for all sustainable end use applications. I think it's important before we sort of dive into um, the development landscape as was specifically requested in North America over the last 32 years, as long as the industry has been alive and more specifically the last almost 11 years now since we coalesced that space is to share our philosophy. I think it, it could be informative, uh, particularly to those who have government ties at the federal or state levels in Australia. Uh, we certainly do not pretend to have uh, understanding acumen of the political process or to have the appropriate levels of access internationally. We do have an international membership. The public education component of what we do uh, certainly translates and travels around the globe. But with respect to the policy advocacy, uh, some of what I'm gonna share is informed by and influences our efforts in North America proper. So you'll have to take that into consideration to the extent you're looking to uh, take any of this away as a derivative. But our philosophy has been that, look, at the end of the day, advocacy and education are what have proven to inform public policy most influentially. And those public policies have influenced the markets that our industry gained eligibility for, is participating in some cases dominating uh, and that we're working to protect and expand and diversify. Those markets drive demand and demand determines value. And of course that value impacts not only revenue, that revenue correlates with the sustainability uh, and the ability of our industry stakeholders, not just to survive, but to thrive. I'm also gonna hasten past, uh, I think what's a fundamental question has already been touched on by a few of my predecessors on the panel with respect to what renewable natural gas is uh, I think I'll pause just long enough to say that um, biogas and biomethane may be interchangeable terms internationally. Uh, we, we have defined um, renewable natural gas as such, and that is reflected in our laws and our uh, different codes and statutes uh, and, and regulations, uh, because there is a, a distinct difference between biogas and biomethane or biogas and renewable natural gas in North America. For example, you can take biogas and you can combust it to generate renewable electricity and you might use that electricity to power your facility on site. But in North America, you cannot put that biogas product into a vehicle or into a utility pipeline. In order to do that and, and to access those 
uh, exponential markets, you have to upgrade or further condition that biogas to uh, a near pure methane content, which we refer to as renewable natural gas. So um, I think it's abundantly clear where RNG comes from. So I'll just note that when we began and in North America in 2011, almost 100% of all renewable natural gas was derived from landfills. And certainly landfills today represent the largest stationary uh, feedstock source. And to the extent and so long as our planet continues to be populated by human beings like yourself and myself and our families, and so long as our family and friends and our pets and livestock are sustained by organic materials, there's always going to be some organic waste. But increasingly, that waste is um, being detoured away from landfills and is being deposited elsewhere. And there's different political opinions as to what's best. And it's our fundamental belief that uh, putting um, organic material in a compost facility really forfeits the energy content that is latent within uh, that decomposing organic material. And thus, it's best served uh, to, to, um, to detour that organic material to a digester. Uh, which is sort of an above ground landfill, if you will. So again, 30 years ago, almost, and, and 11 years ago, almost RNG was derived from landfills. Today, RNG is, is produced from biogas captured, not just at landfills in North America, but increasingly at wastewater treatment plants, at uh, other livestock agriculture operations, including but not limited to dairy farms. Uh, so essentially, wherever organic waste can be found, it will decompose and inevitably it will produce methane. So our industry steps in and we mitigate those harmful methane emissions and uh, convert what is otherwise an environmental liability into an asset for society in the form of ultra low carbon uh, transportation fuel, heat or power to fuel heat and power our vehicles, homes and businesses. A uh, nice little infographic there, the like of which you can find at rngcoalition.com. You can just click on our um, education page and there's a drop down menu there uh, that in, you, creates access to infographics and a host uh, treasure trove really of information that's free and available for download to the general public, including the two following one pagers, which outline uh, the manifold benefits, environmental, economic, and otherwise, associated with the production of renewable natural gas from society's organic waste streams. Um, okay, to the crux of what I've been asked to share, and that is the RNG development landscape. As I mentioned, and to the best of our knowledge, the very first renewable natural gas project in North America was developed in 1982 at the Fresh Kills, yes, you heard that correctly, Fresh Kills Landfill on Staten Island, New York. Uh, you can't help but wonder if there are bodies buried there somewhere, but in any event, uh, that project actually still operates today and renewable natural gas is delivered in the Northeast to hundreds and thousands of customers. Uh, but from that time, over the next 30 years, only one project was built on average per year. So when we coalesced the industry or set out to coalesce the industry in 2011, over the three decades of history prior, only 30 RNG projects had been developed in all of North America. And so that explains largely why most folks, uh, when we began, didn't know what RNG was, where it came from, how it could be used. Um, so we had a work cut out for us. We set out and were ambitious um, and challenged our industry. And by 2015, just four years into our existence, that 30 year annual production average quadrupled from one to four. And we had as our infographic here displays 47 operating RNG facilities. And we were certainly proud of that. So we challenged the industry yet again. And we said, if we do our job, that is through effective advocacy and education, we will create market opportunities through policy, through public education, that's legislation, that's regulation, creating political will, opportunities will unfold that enable the industry to double the number of production facilities that were in operation at the time, 47 to 100. And we, we set a goal of the year 2025, which gave us a decade. We're very proud to say the industry went to work, we rolled our sleeves up, and we eclipsed that 2025 target five and a half years ahead of schedule. And in July of 2019, we brought our 100th renewable natural gas facility online. So again, in December of that year, in 2019, 
at uh, our end of year RNG conference, we, we challenge our industry's leadership with our new SMART initiative. And SMART is an acronym. It stands for our Sustainable Methane Abatement and Recycling Timeline. And it's our initiative to capture and control methane that's produced from more than 43,000 aggregated organic waste sites in North America. And we wanna do that by the mid-century point. So we've been diligent at work, working with our staff, our lab chairs and our membership to not only identify, but now working to meet those early benchmarks in 2025 and 2030 and 2040. So that benchmark for 2025 is 500 projects. By 2030, we wanna see another thousand RNG facilities come online before we start reaching scale and reach 8,000 by 2040 and ultimately 43,000 by the mid-century point. Our smart endowment, which is um, supporting our smart initiative is creating that foundation support to ensure that the environmental, economic and education work that's central to our mission and critical to achieving this initiative can continue reliably in perpetuity. So I mentioned we, we had 47 projects in 2015, just six and a half years ago. We eclipsed our 2025 objective five and a half years early in July of 2019 with our 100th facility. And where we stand today, we have now more than 245 operating renewable natural gas facilities just in the United States and Canada. And I have put here a pro illustration of project or RNG facility map rather, that you can also access and download on our website. Again, that's rngcoalition.com. That gives you a breakdown of where, which states and what provinces each of those facilities are located in, whether or not those projects are, are uh, operating under construction, in development, whether they're pipeline injected, and what the intended use of the RNG is for that specific facility. Again, be that uh, transportation fuel, thermal heat, or power. Um, which begs the question of supply availability. In 2015, we produced as an industry 13 and a half billion cubic feet of renewable natural gas. Five years later, we produced 60 billion cubic feet. And in the next three years, we expect to produce more than 230 billion cubic feet. And that's based on our current and sustained 30% year over year growth rate. There is sufficient RNG that could be developed from organic waste in North America, or just in the United States today, that would be sufficient to replace more than 13% of the total current gas demand in the United States. There's enough RNG to supply and effectively decarbonize 100% of current commercial gas demand in the United States, or 75% of the current residential demand or 45% of total industrial demand. So not an insignificant amount of renewable natural gas that we're talking about and that we're targeting. And of course, as total renewables increase and as society's reliance and dependence on fossil fuels decreases, the percentages that RNG represents actually increases as a larger share of that renewable portfolio. I mentioned development benchmarks already for 2025, for 2030 and 2040. Um, and then I've also included more for the benefit of those as a takeaway who are interested in learning more about some of the policy options that we support and have adopted and implemented and incorporated in our advocacy and education strategies. Uh, and to the extent some of these may transfer, not just down under, but around the world as well, and would be happy to take questions and further discuss these and their applicability offline as a follow-up opportunity to continue our conversation. I've also highlighted some of the industry challenges that we faced. Of course, a challenge is only a challenge if you're looking at the glass as half full. And of course, as ever the optimist, we choose to view the glass uh, as half full. So, um, but we're also realistic and realize that with every challenge, there's an opportunity. So uh, there are no shortage of engagement opportunities to help advance public policy, regardless of the country, continent, region, state, province, city. Um, and, and, and that is true in North America as well. So I will pause there and leave you with my contact information. Thank you again for indulging the opportunity to spend a few minutes with you, to connect with you. I look forward to continuing our conversation and making better use of society's organic waste as we undertake our mission together. Brilliant, thank you so much. And uh, we really do appreciate you joining us today. I am certainly very envious of the policy environment that you're currently working in and hope that we will have a slightly more favourable environment into the future in Australia, which is certainly what we're hoping for. 
Now, as we've run out of time for Q&A in this particular session, 